everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. And today we are talking about Hello Kitty. As always, I'm your host, Kate, and here with Adrian. Hey, how's it going? And Matt. Hello. And we brought on a super special guest, Stefani. Hi. So to get started, why don't you tell everybody about your podcast? Uh, so I'm in a podcast with three of my sisters where we talk about true crime and we try to do it all in Spanish. And we're one of the few true crime podcasts that speak in Spanish or attempt to. And why were you picked to help us talk about Hello Kitty? I really love Hello Kitty since I was a little girl and everything growing up has always been like kawaii and Hello Kitty is kawaii. Like that is a representation of it, at least in my perspective. But yeah. <laughs> and I did spend like 30 minutes in the Hello Kitty. I went three times. I went once and then bought something and then I like left and then went back again. And I'm pretty sure the cashier was really annoyed with me. In Japan, <laughs> yeah. For for you to know, Stefani is uh, my my lady, my the love of my life, who I talked about I... multiple times on the podcast. And we just came back from Japan. I and she's not exaggerating. Like we went to a Hello Kitty thing, and she spent forever in the Hello Kitty thing. So, well, I can say the same thing about you. About you spent forever in Pokemon. I did. I spent a lot of time in Pokemon. <laughs> And we could talk about that on our next Pokemon episode because I'm sure we're going to have another one. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but so to get started, I did want to say that I wanted to do a Sanrio episode, but kind of like what happened with the Kaiju episode that turned into a Godzilla episode. I just, I it was easier just to hone in on one thing. And so I chose you with Hello Kitty. With Hello Kitty. <laughs> yeah. So our <laughs> intro question is, did you find Hello Kitty as a kid or as an adult? So I never found Hello Kitty. Um, found me. Well, I didn't know you were Hello Kitty, apparently. I mean, but You I haven't Hello accepted Kitty. Hello Kitty as your savior yet? No. Um, I knew <laughs> Hello Kitty existed. Um, I know it's a thing. I know people like it. I'm here so I don't get fined. <laughs> that is literally the answer to so many episodes. Yeah. Yeah. What is the, the name of the bunny? That... My Melody? Is it Happy Bunny? My Melody, the one with the, it, she has like the little pink hat on top. Well, I don't think that, like that, I think it's Happy Bunny. Like the, he has like work quotes and stuff and it's like a bunny and it's a bunch of, a bunch of stuff. Yeah, Happy Bunny. I thought Happy Bunny, which is like. Oh, the, you're talking about the ones that are like the little Mel? stickers that you got at Hot Topic? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I thought yeah. that and Hello Kitty were the same thing. No, babe. Uh, because I am a pleb when it comes to Kawaii when I was younger. Uh, so I thought like, oh, yeah, Happy Bunny and Hello Kitty are the same thing. So I didn't really know about Hello Kitty really until I watched, what, what is the Netflix show called? Uh, uh, the Toys That Made Us. Yeah, t- Toys That Made Us. The Hello Kitty episode really <laughs> opened my eyes to like, Hello Kitty is huge. And then when we went to Japan and we, we went to like this Hello Kitty like exhibit thing that was in the Skytree Mall, oh. then then I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This oh thing, like God. Hello Kitty was on everything. There so was I a guess, train with Hello Kitty. So I guess my aunt, I, I didn't really know about Hello Kitty's importance until I was an adult. Because as a kid, I was like, oh, it's just this bunny and a kitty. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's where I'm at. And I haven't accepted like Hello Kitty into my life, but I appreciate Hello Kitty. <laughs> For how happy it makes my wife. So, <laughs> uh, so when we were in Seattle, was it was it when we were in Seattle the first time when it was still Mopop or yeah, yes, the Yankee Museum. Yes, yeah, there was a giant Hello Kitty exhibit, and we were there, and Matt was walking one way, and then I saw Hello Kitty, and then I ran the other way, and I got to see one of the giant like traveling Hello Kitty exhibits. Uh, because I found Hello Kitty when I was younger, and like I said earlier, like. I've always had Sanrio in my life because my cousin, uh, specifically, like my, my, she's like 10, 11 years older than me. She collected Kropi. And then I found one of her little Baditz Maru, like, uh, it was like a little tiny, like, pouch. And it had like a little eraser set in it. Um, and I had that. And then I found Hello Kitty after from one of my, uh, my friends in school. Because she uh, she was Japanese American and she introduced me to Sailor Moon and she introduced me to Hello Kitty and it was amazing and I've never turned back and I love everything that Sanrio does. Um, 
So she sounds yes. like an amazing person <laughs> that introduced you to these things. Yes. <laughs> Stefani, what about you? What what do you mean? When did I get first introduced? Yeah. Um dang. I don't really probably when my sister printed out you know like whenever you had to decorate your binder? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's I was still a part of that. Anyways. <laughs> So she printed out, like, the coloring pages for Hello Kitty and, like, gave them to me. And that's how I was introduced. And then I was introduced to, like, the two angels, little twin stars. And then Keropi. And then it was the Batsmaru? Yeah, Batsmaru. As well. Like, that she, like, just kept printing them out to me. And, like, I know it was, like, crazy for her to be printing those out because at the time it was really hard to, like, copy and paste or, like, really find and be able to print that stuff. So, yeah, that's how I got introduced. But my sister is, like, obsessed with Hello Kitty, just Hello Kitty itself. Like, her whole house is, like, filled with it. So when I saw the exhibit for Hello Kitty in Japan, I was, like, crying because I was, like, I'm going to show this special moment with my sister. And she was, like holding back tears because she couldn't be there with me but I was there for her and like showing showing her around around. now I'm getting emotional but yeah she loves Hello Kitty so much but she's the one that showed it to me yeah (laughs) that's awesome um it's really cool too because like I've I would say like the most most of the people in my life that like love Hello Kitty they always found it like later so it's really cool to hear at least for V Stefani that like you've always had it (laughs) yeah i that like I said, I can't remember a time where I don't didn't have Hello Kitty in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so getting into the history like we always do, um, we're gonna start with a little bit of Sanrio because we had to start at the beginning. And in 1962, Shintaro Suji founded Sanrio, and he began selling rubber sandals with flowers painted on them. Uh, and Suji noted the profits gained by adding a cute design to the sandals and hired cartoonists to design cute characters for his merchandise instead. And the company then produced a line of merchandise around gift giving occasions. If you're not familiar, um, gift giving is a piece of social communication that's rooted in Japan's tradition. Like you give gifts for everything and it doesn't have to be extravagant. A lot of the times they're super, super little. And so that, um, it kind of sits in Sanrio, or that is the basis for Sanrio's motto, which is a uh, small gift, big smile. And all of their lines focus on little things that are sold, or that's how it started out. And ultimately, they ended up hiring manga, uh, shoujo manga uh, artists to come in and uh, animate everything. By the late 1960s, he had secured the licensing rights for Japan for goods emblazoned with the Snoopy character from Charles M. Schultz's Peanuts. Uh, And then Suji ended up turning his attention to developing character-driven products by hiring the manga artists. And this was because, if you don't know how royalties work, licensing is really great if you own, like, a patent for a product. Licensing is really bad when you just start producing other people's stuffs in a different country because then you just pay out all the money to the creator of that design versus getting your own. So, ultimately, in 1974, Hello Kitty was introduced by Yuki Shimizu and was added to the early lineup of the, uh, I don't want to call it a stable, even though they're all animals, but, like, the uh, the Sanrio characters, the families of Sanrio characters. Um, don't say that they're in a stable. They have their own agency. I know. And I'm just kidding. I have no idea, but... They do, and some <laughs> of them are humans, so... Yeah. yeah. Um... But yeah, so the character's first appearance on an item was a vinyl coin purse in Japan, where she was pictured sitting between a bottle of milk and a goldfish bowl, goldfish bowl with the word hello above her. She ended up coming to the United States in 1976 with a store in San Jose, California. Um, Does that store old, still exist? I don't know. I don't, but the coin purse, coin purse thing makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. A whole ton of sense. Yeah, because they're a uh, huge <laughs> coin-based society. So, like, the coin purse first makes sense more than anything. And I'm surprised we didn't buy you a coin purse purse when we went. Well, I don't know. Well, I have my kitty one. It's true. It's also Kawaii, so. Basically it's also one of the things that I realized is that, like, the majority of the stuff that I ever owned from Sanrio was always, like, a small bag. 
Yeah, I mean, like, what that's... I have now is a makeup bag with all of the Sanrio characters. Yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. Like that would be the first thing, and it's super smart that they went that route for sure. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah. Uh. Keep in mind too, Hello Kitty is not. Although she's probably the one that you recognize the most in the U.S. As we've kind of already said, like there are hundreds upon hundreds of Sanrio characters. They pumped these things out. And Hello Kitty hasn't always been the most profitable or the most recognized. Um, So Sanrio decided to make Hello Kitty British because at the time when she was created, foreign countries, in particular Britain, were were trendy in Japan. Uh, If you don't know, and if you're an anime watcher, you'll know this, a lot of British lore and Britain as a place is really key especially the victorian era um a lot of japanese pop culture does revolve around ang- uh, is it anglophilia which is just like an intense love of stuff from britain the british empire all that type of stuff um and it's it's shown in a lot of the clothing so like lolita clothing all the type of stuff uh so it makes sense that they made her british um, but on top of that, Senryo had already had a number of characters that were set in the U.S. And it wanted Hello Kitty to be different. Shimizu got the name Kitty from Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking, Ga- Through the Looking Glass, where in a scene in the early book, Alice plays with a cat she calls Kitty. Hello Kitty sold immediately well after launch in 1974, and Sanrio sales increased seven times up until they slumped temporarily in 1978. A lot of that was due to the... Um, the issues that Japan had economically, um, which is when they ended up bringing in Yuku Yamaguchi as the main designer of Hello Kitty's history. New series with Hello Kitty essentially in a different theme designs, but still the same. Um, When you think about a lot of like the cultural icons and images that we have in the US, especially animation based, they're constantly changing. Faces change, eyes change. Even when you look at like the way anime gets made now, especially if it's from an existing franchise, that looks drastically different than from than when it first came out. Hello Kitty is constant, um, just like almost all the Sanrio characters. They don't really update them. But what happened was when Yamaguchi came on, she expanded Hello Kitty's wardrobe and put her in different scenarios that actually showcased the identity that they wanted her to give to children and like young girls like she wanted to play the piano Yamaguchi was the first one to actually draw her uh, Hello Kitty and her family you know around a piano um but beyond that they were able to put Hello Kitty in different situations um and actually her name isn't Hello Kitty her name is Kitty White um she has an actual last name um and so ultimately what ends up happening is after this gets launched you have a new focus that follows current trends and is inspired by existing fashion movies and tv and kind of this identity of hello kitty just shifts throughout time and makes it something that is consumable regardless of decade year any of that stuff it kind of makes it timeless um hello kitty was originally marketed only towards a child and preteen audience but in the 1990s, the target market for Hello Kitty was brought in to include teens and adults as a retro brand, which is where I know I came into it and my cousin came into it. Um, but I didn't know it was retro. I thought it was just a new cool thing. I didn't know that it was marketed as like a retro brand or that it was that old. I thought Hello Kitty was a 90s creation for the longest time. Um, I don't think you're wrong there. Yeah. Like, I think yeah, a lot of people thought that. Yeah, because when you look at the when you look at like the history of Hello Kitty, even when we we went to the Sky Tree Mall and like the, the Netflix show, I was like, whoa, 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 like this has been going on since like the '60s. Yeah, like we're just like plebs when it comes to like culture when it, in America. Uh, yeah, so I don't think you're alone in that at all. Yeah, I mean, because ultimately, like when you look at how they did their marketing, they marketed it. Um, as people who could not get Hello Kitty merchandise as children or who fondly remember the stuff that they had. But the cool thing <laughs> is, if you look at like people in our generation, it's people who had no idea it existed. <laughs> and then it gets brought in as a new thing. Um, 
that was when Sanrio began expanding and selling Hello Kitty branded products such as purses and laptops. I actually convinced my mom. What? A laptop? That's when they start. Yeah, there's a Hello Kitty laptop. What's its specs? I don't know, but there are multiple Hello Kitty <laughs> laptops. I tried to convince my mom to get me one when I graduated. It didn't work. She said no. It's probably a good decision. Hold up. Hello Kitty. Yeah, I was going to say, because like, Japan was on some next level stuff when it comes to technology, so I'm pretty sure like they put all of their money into their Hello Kitty laptop. Right? I don't doubt it. <laughs> I got Maybe my that's... mom to buy me a toaster, and I had the little Polaroid camera. So I believe the purses and obviously the toasters and whatnot, because you can slap some labels and stickers and everything on. But I mean, honestly, laptop Hello Kitty is... laptop is just reskinning it. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Are we putting we... a Hello Kitty like label? That's what I'm asking. Like, like, I mean, you I guess do the Xbox when it, Xbox was like, hey, here we go, see. Acer, Acer limited edition Hello Kitty laptop. That's insane. Like, oh. Acer put out a Hello Kitty laptop. <laughs> I would have bought this. Oh my god, this wasn't yeah. the one I saw when I wanted it, but. I also forgot that Acer is actually that old. <laughs> no, this was recent. Like that oh, was overall. Like that. They're like, still the making Hello Kitty laptops. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I meant like the '90s is when they started doing all of this other stuff. So up until that point, they kept it as a small gift brand, doing little one-off things, little like kitschy items. And then in the '90s, they start transitioning into more like let's put Hello Kitty's face on everything. I yeah. had a Hello Kitty toaster. I had Hello Kitty USB drives. I had Hello Kitty slippers. I had Hello Kitty headphones. Because I worked at Hot Topic, so I got a lot of it oh, 40% yeah, off. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, and it was amazing. And so like, I had Hello Kitty everything that I could find that they had. And I convinced my mom into getting me a Hello Kitty toaster for my dorm. And it broke, like, the first few months. Yeah, this Acer that video well. that has 10 million views is literally the unboxing the world's cutest laptop. <laughs> it's the Hello Kitty yeah. Acer laptop. Um, and it's pretty kawaii, so I think I think they marketed it correctly. <laughs> there is also a Hello Kitty Fender guitar too. I don't doubt it. I actually want to look at there's, there's Hello a Hello Kitty, Kitty gaming paper. chair now too. I'm surprised there's no Hello Kitty pads. I'm surprised by that. <laughs> they should be marketing that. I'd be buying it. I'd be like, yep. yep. Sanrio is literally like the, the Sanrio is like the. The company about slapping stuff on things and people will buy it. Yeah, I guess yeah. Disney's up there because of Star Wars. Because I have those energy drinks sitting in my shelf unopened. So, hey, we do <laughs> too. It's okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Matt. You're lucky I don't spend this much money anymore. Um, anyway. <laughs> Am I lucky? <laughs> they definitely have... Hello Kitty sanitary products. Um, <gasps> they buy them for me. <laughs> <laughs> they do. So Hello so, Kitty is enormous. <laughs> so in 1994 to 1996, Face Series was the first to be designed for a more mature appeal. And according to Sanrio, in 1989, Hello Kitty appeared on 12,000 different products yearly. Uh, by 2008, Hello Kitty was responsible for half of Sanrio's one billion revenue, and there were over fifty thousand different Hello Kitty branded products in more than sixty countries. Uh, beginning in two thousand and seven, following trends in Japan, Sanrio began using darker designs for Hello Kitty with more black and less pink, and pulling away from the kawaii styles. Which I don't really understand how that's how they classify because I look up what this era of Hello Kitty is, and it's literally just shopping Hello Kitty to like goths and Harajuku girls. And she's she's still very kawaii, but she just isn't wearing bright pink. Yeah. Um, I had a Hot Topic shirt with her where she was like goth Hello Kitty, and it was an official Sanrio shirt, like. The fact that Sanrio just is so open to changing their characters to fit different styles and sell things is actually really unique, especially in the space when you have somebody like Nintendo who greatly, greatly protects all of their products. Hey, man. Hello Kitty. Sanrio was not afraid to go rar. Oh, my rar God. Adrian, stop. I mean, they might not admit it to me and Matt's demographic, 
but I, I remember like Hello Kitty being a little goth. So I think I, I remember like the, the kind of designs you're talking about, Kate. So, I mean, it's smart. It worked. When you make over half of $1 billion revenue, like you, if you change it and it works, go for it. Yeah. Well, and, and like the thing is, too, uh, Sanrio actually made Karomi, which is an, it, it, she's like a goth little rabbit with like a black head, head thing and like a skull, a pink mm-hmm. skull. And she's also super kawaii. Yeah, there was a section in the exhibit where it was, like, all goth of her. I was like, yep, I see you, Hello Kitty, when I was 13. <laughs> um, so beyond that, uh, and, and it should be said, too, uh, last, so at Hello Kitty's, I think, 40th, 40th anniversary, uh, Hello Kitty made $8 billion alone. So, yeah. That's huge. That's a lot of money. That's yeah. insane. Like eight billion dollars. Like where? I'm trying to see, and you can cut this out, Kate. But I'm trying to see where does that put Hello Kitty in the terms of its like revenue base as like a marketing standpoint. I don't know. Depends on what you're asking for. Like merchandise, like merchandising. Like we you know when we talk about Pokemon, right? Like Pokemon is like without a doubt like the biggest marketed merchandising thing on the planet. But Hello Kitty has to be up there, right? So the Hello Kitty universe ranks second only to Nintendo's Pokemon as yeah. the largest retail revenue franchise in the world. They've accumulated over $50 billion in sales through 2018 with an $8 billion year aver- yearly average. That's insane. When you're second to only Pokemon, which is huge. Like, that's how, like, even, like, that's huge for not even touching, like, you know, for example, like, me and Matt's market, Right. Like, me and Matt's market is still Pokemon, right? But we're not Hello Kitty, and you're still number two? That's insane. And I think, I honestly think it's because Sanrio had the, like, the forethought to be like, we should stop just targeting children, and we should definitely target adults. And we should target people who do not know how to not spend money just because we slap a sticker on it. See. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, you keep saying my demographic. I was like, I don't buy things because of stickers or anything. So, well, I'm talking about like I buy things that are cute. I have a giant red panda sitting on my pin bag in this office because he was cute. So. And, and, and demographic, I mean, like, I mean, we're, I mean, the these was, we're we're heteronormative males. Like, we're not we're not the kawaii demographic by any means. And you're still able to make this much money when you're not targeting heteronormative like demographics. That's crazy. Compared to Pokemon, like you're number two to Pokemon. Like that's crazy. We've covered Pokemon for two episodes because of how big they are. And Hello Kitty's able to make those numbers at number two. That's insane. Cuteness sells. Kawaii OP. Kawaii OP. Uh yeah, and so uh, in 2014, Hello Kitty celebrated their 40th anniversary uh, in the Arigato Everyone birthday celebration, which took place in San Rio Puro Land in Tokyo for several days. Um, so that was one of the biggest achievements. Now they are at 45 years. Um, and yeah. Yeah, it's, I even got a little kind of coin thing. with the 45 year uh, anniversary. Cute. Which it still weirds me out that she's that old. Like I, I just don't. And she just it. hasn't changed that much, right? Like the design, like other than like no. targeting kind of like that other kind of you know darker demographic. Like her design really hasn't changed that much, and it her just design, worked. Her design, no, her font is still classic and still. Like I think that's the other thing is that I didn't really associate it with it being old because. When I saw it as a little girl, it's still the same, and it's been years now, and it still looks fresh AF. Like, looks new. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that it has that has to do with her stain her stain power, is because like no matter when you came to her, and there one there is a version of Hello Kitty for everybody, but that version still looks the same. It's um, the classic. But yeah. Um, also, if you really want some spooky stuff, go watch the uh, Karomi and My Melody like cartoon. It's actually really cool. But she's like the actual goth kitty. <laughs> but any or goth bunny. But anyway, uh, this is a Hello Kitty episode, and now uh, 
After this message, we're going to get into our But Why Those. Hey everyone, do you like But Why Though? Well, the PodCoin app is a podcast player that pays you to listen to this podcast and every other podcast. Just get the PodCoin app on your iPhone or Android and start listening today. It's free and super easy to use with every minute you listen getting you that sweet, sweet coins. It turns your podcast listening into charity. Or if you're like me, you can get some Amazon or Starbucks gift cards. I use the PodCoin app to do all my podcast listening now and I can personally say that I love it. Seriously, just go to the PodCoin app and use invite code BUTWHYTHO, that's B-U-T-W-H-Y-T-H-O, and you'll get 300 PodCoin just for signing up if you use our code. That's 300 PodCoin just for signing up using code BUTWHYTHO. So go ahead and give PodCoin a try today. Uh, okay, so now it's time for the but why those, and the first one is it really should not have succeeded. Hello Kitty, Sanrio had everything stacked against it when it came to the US because when it came to the US it stuck with its Japanese marketing style which didn't really translate. Uh, it is, it had two issues that kept it from succeeding right away and that was no one knew what it was and then no one knew what it was. Which sounds weird but ultimately the sales suffered because the focus was still on Japanese products so rice bowls, um, chopsticks, uh, little tiny kitschy items that at the time really weren't selling. It wasn't focused on action figures, anything like that. And ultimately what it's competing with is established toys that have franchises backing them. This is the time that you have G.I. Joe essentially making an entire animated series over a toy. And Hello Kitty existed just as Hello Kitty, and Sanrio existed just as Sanrio. So that was the second factor. They had nothing to back it up. They just came into the American market, and people thought it was cute, and some people bought it, uh, some people didn't. The um, Unsurprisingly, the highest demographic that bought it were Asian Americans, and that's also what led it to becoming a symbol for a lot of Asian American young girls, um, which is really cool when you think about it. And... Ultimately, Sanrio's success in the U.S. in the 90s comes from hiring a U.S. marketing team, finally, to make it really mesh with what we have. But also because of the changes that Yuko Yamaguchi made that I mentioned earlier. Um, because she started to change Hello Kitty's fashion sense, scenarios, all that stuff, and really push Hello Kitty into a different space it allowed the company to really get a foothold in the American market. Um, and it clicked really easily because at the time, and this is um, and this is something that I really remember, like I had Hello Kitty stuff because it was super cheap. Um, mm. One of Sanrio's focuses, it's less, it's less so in the States because, and, and it, it gets different when you start expanding to stuff like laptops and diamond necklaces. But ultimately, at Stanrio stores, the focus is having products that kids can go in and buy and then give as gifts. So they're, they have a really low price point, or they've attempted to maintain it. The U.S., it's a little... Like, I think when I was a kid and we would go in and buy Sanrio stuff, it was cheap. And that was, like, that was one of the main reasons why we had it. But then when I started working on Hot Topic, everything was jacked up. Like, even the small little things, um, because it was imported, it was Japanese, and they could slap more money on it, which, I mean, made sense for here yeah. in the So, US. when you when you say, like, the first, like, things you bought, like, were, like, were, like, the first things you bought of Hello Kitty? Like, were they just stickers? Erasers, or was it erasers? Books. Like, what was it? Stationary sets. Yeah. I yeah, fucking okay, love stationary sense. sets. So, I bought stationary sets with the jumbo erasers, the stackable pencils. So like, I don't think they make them anymore, but it came with like the lead stacked on top of each other. And when one went out, you'd take it out, you'd put it in the bottom, you'd put a new one on top. That um, was a terrible was, design and decision. It was awful. None of them ever worked, but it looked really cute on my desk. Um, and a whole bunch of like little like pencil pouches or like my very first thing was a Bad It's Maru like little eraser pouch that had like, it came with like a little like, like erasers and a sharpener and like it just went with stationary stuff um and then i had a little coin purse as well but i got that at a flea market i didn't get that at an actual store um 
But yeah, those were the first things that I bought. And then when I got older, it was like, I'm going to buy this giant Hello Kitty purse and this giant Hello Kitty bag and a toaster. And then Stefani's first things was uh, stealing stuff off the internet and putting it on binders. So like super cheap. <laughs> so neither of you bought the Hello Kitty laptop. Is that what you're telling me? You didn't buy the Hello Kitty laptop and you left Hello Kitty? What's wrong with you guys? First of all, you're my bank. So why haven't you bought it for me? What's going also on true. here? Sorry. Also sorry. You should be asking yourself this question. <laughs> Speaking of which, I found the Hello Kitty laptop on eBay. Oh, God. It's loading. <laughs> I was like, how much is that? It's taking a real long time to load. It you means know, your computer's getting a virus. Like, learning, learning about the stationary stuff, it makes a lot of sense because, like, my first memory of, like, actually seeing something with Hello Kitty on it was at the corner store that was, like, an Asian market. The one by Dairy Queen and all that stuff, like, that area. Where yes, people from El Paso at. will know people what you're talking about. People from El Paso about. will know what I'm talking about. Northeast. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that's when I remember, like, it being a blue Hello Kitty notebook and their racers. And now after going to Japan, I get it why that was even there. Yeah, they love their stationery. Man, they do. Holy crap, they do. And that was also one of the reasons why it didn't work at first was because before they hired an American team, everything that they sold in the U S was made to like what worked in Japan. So Mm. like uh, notepad sizes, folders, all those things Mm. were made for Japanese stationery, not American. And so a lot of people didn't want to buy it. Um, But the cool thing is now hello kitty has everything. (laughs) And we kind of touched on it already. Um, but, Stefani, what is, like, the one Hello Kitty product that you've seen that isn't stationary that if you had any money, like, unlimited money, you would you would buy? Any price range? Uh, God, can it be a list? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I've always wanted the classic necklace. Because, you know, I got to fulfill my my younger age when I was a kid <laughs> dreams. When, like, I think Paris Hilton was rocking it, I think. I was yeah. like, right? Okay, and it was yeah. made, uh, I think that's the, you're, tra- you're talking about, like, the small ones or, like, mm-hmm. the big, like, di- yeah. I think Kimora Lee Simmons made that line, I think. I can't remember, but I did see it at the exhibit there, and I was like, I've always wanted this necklace. And a giant Hello Kitty stuffed Hello Kitty in my room. Not gonna lie, I want the giant Hello Kitty. With <laughs> and with the Totoro <laughs> as well next to it. <laughs> Those are like um, the two main things. But I will say this, I definitely go the same. I don't want a necklace, but they had I remember growing up uh not growing up, but like when I was working in the mall, I think it was Zales or something, they had this really cute silver bracelet. That, mm-hmm. like, had, like, a little Hello Kitty, like, lock type thing on it. And she had, like, little diamonds. Oh, yeah. Want. All this I is mean, to I say. Nev- I would never wear the necklace, but I just want it. <laughs> uh, but all this is an example of there's Hello Kitty everything. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, even though she was originally aimed at, pre-adoles- at the pre-adolescent girl market, the Hello Kitty product range has expanded and goes from dolls, stickers, greeting cards, clothes, accessories, school supplies, and stationery to purses, toasters, televisions, other home appliances, massagers, and computer equipment. And these products range from mass market to high-end consumer products. Um, so we start looking at a lot of the high-end stuff, Sanrio and various corporate partners have released Hello Kitty branded part uh, a whole bunch of Hello Kitty branded products. Some of them we've talked about already. Um, but for these, this also in- included a Hello Kitty Stratocaster electric guitar from Fender, an Airbus, a, I don't know what that is, but it's an Airbus commercial, pa- uh, commercial passenger jet airliner dubbed the Hello Kitty jet, which was then later got, they later got their own fleet of Hello Kitty jets. Um, and this was from EVA Airways in Taiwan. Um, and then, however, due to high, high demand, the airline added the airline added two more onto their existing 
jets. So there is a fleet of Hello Kitty airplanes that I've will fly this. you. Where are they? They're from Taiwan. Yep. We have to go to Taiwan now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just from like looking at these pictures, there are business class seats with like just Hello Kitty everything. And I feel like you would love them. Yeah. Make it happen. <laughs> I think you'd both would be like, wow, I get a Hello Kitty pillow. I'm going to take it all home. <laughs> I would take it home. <laughs> I'd put it in my purse. In my suitcase. <laughs> um, in 2009, Hello Kitty entered the wine market as well with a collection of four wines available for purchase online. Um, which continued their expansion of products into older audiences. And w- so um, Stefani and me both talked about jewelry. In 2005, Simmons Jewelry Company and Sanrio announced a partnership. Kimora Lee Simmons for Hello Kitty was launched exclusively at Neiman Marcus, with prices ranging from $300 to $5,000. Uh, all designed by Kimora Lee Simmons and launched as an initial collection, the jewelry was all handmade, consisting of diamonds, gemstones, semi-precious stones, 18 karat gold, sterling silver, enamel, and ceramic. Yeah, with the red gem on her bow. <laughs> In the fall of 2008, Simmons Jewelry Company and Sanrio debuted a collection of jewelry and watches named Hello Kitty by Simmons Jewelry Company. And this collection was launched at Zales to further expand the reach of the brand, and it developed accessories to satisfy every Hello Kitty fan. And these are, like, the smaller ones and, like, the more affordable ones than what was available at Nima Marcus. Um, And the designs, again, incorporated colorful gemstones, sterling silver, and aimed at attracting a more youthful audience than more of the high end. There is also an entire line of Hello Kitty coffee. Um, specifically, there are themed, there is a themed restaurant named Hello Kitty Sweets in Taipei, Taiwan, which opened in 2008. The restaurant's decor and many of its dishes dishes are patterned after the Hello Kitty character. Uh, there is a Hello Kitty diner in Chatswood, Sydney, Australia, and a Hello Kitty dim sum restaurant in Kaolong, Hong, uh, Hong Kong. Um... There are Hello Kitty cafes that have opened all over the world, including Seoul and other locations in South Korea, Bangkok, Thailand, Adelaide, Australia, Irvine, California, and the Santa Anita Mall in California. Those all have Hello Kitty cafes, so add them to your travel list. Um... There is also, and this is probably the most weird one that I found, there's a Hello Kitty themed maternity hospital in Yolin, Taiwan. Hello Kitty is featured on receiving blankets, room decor, bed linens, and even birth certificate covers and nurses' uniforms. The hospital's owner explained that he hoped that the theme would help ease the stress of childbirth. It would ease my childbirth. Adrian, what the heck? We are going yeah, to save some money. You, obviously, we are going right. to save some and money. And it's all in Taiwan. So you only have to go to one place to get all the Hello Kitty stuff. Look. Yeah, you only get, have to travel while you're pregnant. And we have look, to stay in Taiwan. So you can have. I'll bring you a Hello Kitty blanket. It's okay. It's, <laughs> like, no. It'll be okay. Decorate the whole room. If you're going to give me that experience, take me there or decorate the whole room. I'm, I'm looking at it and it's just like Hello Kitty wallpaper. <laughs> like, it's okay, babe. We'll, we'll figure it out. No. This is actually pretty insane, though. <laughs> like, Why this is Hello Kitty so AF. Much? Like, this Stephanie is ridiculously... real sad that you just told her no to Taiwan. You make me sad. Y- y'all can't see it, but she was losing her mind on the video when Kate mentioned all of that. But it's, I'm looking at, I'm looking at like, the, like, the listing now. At that p- it, it's, it's pretty Hello Kitty for a hospital. Like, Kate saying it made me think, oh my god, maybe I should get pregnant. I wasn't really thinking about getting pregnant, but maybe I should get pregnant now just so I can experience it. Why did you have your first child? Hello, Kitty. (laughs) Why did you have your first child? Because I wanted to have a baby in the Hello Kitty hospital in Taiwan. Oh my god. That's nuts. That's crazy. Um, Yeah, I love Pokemon, but is there like a Pokemon-themed hospital anywhere? No. Probably not. And they actually have designs for that. 
<laughs> um, so Hello Kitty is included as a part of the Sanrio Library at the Japanese theme parks Harmony Land and Sanrio's Pearl Land. Uh, there is also a lot of clothing partnerships. One most notably in 2018 was Puma, when they collaborated with Hello Kitty for Puma X Hello Kitty for All Time collection which features the company's signature sneakers for both children and adults and i didn't know that until i did this research and now i want to go buy some some pumas yes i haven't bought some pumas in a long time i haven't either they're pretty like, clean since, like, i'm looking at them right now they're pretty clean let me see let me see let me see i'll, I'll well i'll show you it's, it's pretty clean i want these just as much as i want those nano those uh thanos uh adidas those are really good uh anyway beyond that hello kitty also has an animated series now multiple animated series actually there have been several different hello kitty tv series the first animated television series was hello kitty's furry tale theater an anime series that was 13 episodes long and aired in 1987 fun fact um yamaguchi who did uh all of the designs for hello kitty Hated this because she didn't want Hello Kitty to have a mouth. Fans also found it weird. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Also, if you didn't know, I got a lot of the information from the Toys That Made Us episode. <laughs> um, uh, the next, uh, the next was an OVA titled uh, "Hello Kitty and Friends," which came out in 1993 and was also 30 episodes long. Then there was Hello Kitty's Paradise. It came out in 1999 at 16 episodes. Hello Kitty Stump Village came out in 2005, and then The Adventures of Hello Kitty and Friends came out in 2006. That one had 52 episodes. A crossover series with the development name Kiss Hello Kitty and pairing animated versions of the members of the rock band Kiss with Hello Kitty was announced in March of 2013. And it was to be produced by Gene Simmons and planned to air on the Hub Network, which is now Discovery Family. But it never aired on any network. And I'm kind of sad about it because it sounds amazing. So where can just, we find it? Was it just going to be like normal Hello made. Kitty? Or was it going to be like goth Hello Kitty? Because either way it works for me. But I'm sad that this, this never got aired. All I think about is I got to go. But they have an entire line of Hello Kitty kiss figures. Mm -hmm. um, and they're adorable. <gasps> I love them. Oh, so much. A little tongue. Those oh, are actually really so cool, cute. actually. Um, as we move forward from that, Hello Kitty's Paradise was also a long-running live-action children's program that aired on TXN from January 1999 to March of 2011. It was the longest-running weekly kids' television program in the network's history. In January 2011, the show's creator creators mutually agreed to end the series after 12 seasons with the final episode being broadcast in march of that year then in 2018 scenario began streaming a cgi animated series on youtube it features hello kitty talking to the camera about her life in style in the style of vlogging and virtual youtubers so with that one i want to say it's really weird because hello kitty is actually fun fact not a cat she is just a third grader a third grade british girl um and that seems well, i haven't watched any of it i want to watch it i'm gonna but... subscribe i don't care after this i'm subscribing and i'm watching it i'm so intrigued by this <laughs> but she's a third grader how did she get anywhere uh, i don't know I'm how do some of these kids get anywhere come on their I'm parents confused. Uh, also, Hello Kitty had two manga comics that were serious, se serialized in Ribbon, a shoujo manga magazine. Hello Kitty Doki ran from May 2007 to, 2000, uh, to April 2008, and Hello Kitty Peace was released in 2008. In 2016, Sanrio launched a webcomic featuring Hello Kitty as a strawberry-themed superhero called Ichigo Man. Uh, Ichigo beating strawberry. Um, who fights monsters with the help of her giant robot. The webcomic is created by Toshiki Inoue and uh, Shakua Shinkai and updates once a month. The Ichigoman alter ego originates from a 2011 ex exhibition of Yamaguchi's artwork. 
The really cool thing when you look at a lot of uh, Yamaguchi's designs that either haven't been used or have been used or just concepts, she puts Hello Kitty in so many different situations and it's amazing. And she will refuse to draw a mouth for all of them. Good. Oh, how exciting. Um, on top of that, Hello Kitty also has her own damn album. Uh, Hello World featuring Hello Kitty inspired songs performed by a collection of artists, including Kiki Palmer, Corey Yarkin, and Angel Emmy. Hello Kitty was also chosen by AH Software to be the basis of the Vocaloid Nakamura Iroha uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of San Rio. Numerous Hello Kitty games have also been produced and released. The first title for Famicom coming in 1992. Um, however, the majority of these games were never released outside of Japan. Hello Kitty also has cameo appearances uh, featuring other Sanrio characters, such as the Kropi games, Karo Karo Kropi, or Bokaniki Nemuro Mori no crawling and then special edition consoles such as the hello kitty dreamcast the hello kitty game boy pocket the hello kitty crystal xbox have also been released exclusively in japan i knew about the hello kitty xbox and it makes me really sad that i could never get it well matt as like the oldest gamer and like the one who's played like the most obscure games did you play any hello kitty games back in the day <laughs> no <laughs> okay me neither okay cool but I bet I could have. I bet I could have got the Hello Kitty Dreamcast only because you could find any game for the Dreamcast. Also true. <laughs> um, also, y'all should look up the Hello Kitty uh, Crystal Xbox because it's funny. Anyway, Hello Kitty also appears as a guest character in Sonic's Driver, uh, Sonic uh, Sega's Sonic Dash in 2016 as a part of Sega's partnership with Sanrio. And yet also appeared in Super Mario Maker as a mystery mushroom costume that can be unlocked by playing the event course Hello Kitty and My Melody. Yeah, I'm actually super interested in like how the uh, like licensing worked for that. Like Nintendo and Hello Kitty worked together to put on I don't know. How did that work? That was the two biggest people making like stuff in Japan and they just put each other in the game. That's crazy. I like that. <laughs> Um, in total, Hello Kitty has 18 video games. The majority of them are platformers. There's also puzzlers as well as kart racing and mobile games. Again, almost all of them are only in Japan. Um, there were also three Hello Kitty anime films released in Japan. Hello Kitty Cinderella, which released in 1987. Hello Kitty no Oyayubi Hime, which was released in 1990. And Hello Kitty no Maho no Mori no Hime-sama which was released in 1991. And in 2015, ha uh, Sanrio announced a full-length Hello Kitty theatrical feature, which was originally planned for 2019. Um, however, in early 2019, it was revealed that New Line Cin Cinema would be teaming up alongside Sanrio and Flynn Picture Company for an English-language film based on the kid brand, which I'm kind of worried about because I feel like they should have just made it for adults. But yes, all of this is to say that, unfortunately, Hello Kitty's popularity in japan peaked in the late 1990s and she was the country's top grossing character in 2002 hello kitty lost her place as a top grossing character in japan in the character databank popularity chart and in 20 in a 2010 survey she was in third place behind um anpa man and pikachu from pokemon and if you don't know anpa man he is actually what one punch man is parodying yeah he's everywhere Absolutely yeah. everywhere in Japan. Like the same level of like Hello Kitty and Pikachu. He's yeah. everywhere in all the commercials. It's actually insane. And while some people have uh, quoted Hello Kitty's like slight decline in Japan as the reason why Sanrio's brand doesn't work, overseas, Hello Kitty's popularity just keeps increasing. With worldwide annual sales that reach $8 billion, like I said earlier in this episode, and she's been particularly popular in other Asian countries outside of Japan, such as China, where her cultural impact is comparable to that of Barbie in the Western world. Yeah, I mean, like, no one in the U.S. really knows who... Anpa Man is, but everyone knows who Pikachu and Hello Kitty is, so like they're doing they're doing all right. They're doing okay. <laughs> also, I Googled it, no Hello Kitty musical that I can find. Kind of disappointed by that. She has That's no like, mouth. 
I mean, but like it's a, she like has put a head on the like no ice like no ice capades for the Hello Kitty. Yeah, ice capades for Hello Kitty. I mean, Shrek has a musical. You can't give Hello Kitty a musical. <laughs> Shrek That's has fair. at least a mouse, though. <laughs> true. True. I don't know. How... They, they, Adrian is right. They could just put a giant head on her. Come on, Broadway. Give me a musical with Hello Kitty. <laughs> Do it, you cowards. <laughs> Do it, you cowards. You gave Lion King a musical. Give me Hello Kitty musical. Yes. So this is like, I put it as a but why though, but it's really just something that I really wanted to talk about. And it's her lack of a mouth because <laughs> it's caused a lot of like, we're going to get into it. Okay. So ultimately, a spokesperson from Sanrio has said that Hello Kitty does not have a mouth because they want people to be able to project their feelings onto the character and be happy or sad together with Hello Kitty. I think it's a great idea because this let goth Hello Kitty be goth. Um, and they didn't have to change anything. Um, another explanation Sanrio has given for her lack of mouth is that she speaks from the heart. She's Sanrio's ambassador to the world and isn't bound by any particular language. So we'll just um, go with the first one. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, in animation, Kitty White, which is Hello Kitty's name, uh, only has a mouth while talking, but not while silent. So if you look at a lot of the old animations, like some of the first ones, it's really creepy. Because she's just walking, and then all of a sudden a mouth appears. Um, See, Adrian, that's what you want? Yeah. That's what you want in this musical? <laughs> Matt, think about it. You're in this musical, no mouth, and then somehow, like, digitally or, like, robotic-wise, a mouth um, automatically appears, and she starts singing and talking. That sounds creepy. I'm down. Let's do it. Robot Overlords, <laughs> give me Hello Kitty musical where she has no mouth when she's not talking, but mouth when she's singing. That sounds like a terrible idea. Obviously, like this would be marketed to the adults. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very oh scary God. for kids. But I, I would, I would go. Let's do it. Oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our listeners now have nightmares. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the reasons, and we've kind of been mentioning it almost all episode, but one of the reasons that she doesn't have a mouth, a lot of it has to do with the idea of kawaii, which we've been using throughout the entire episode, and it isn't just cute. Like, it is a very specific type of cute. Um, and when it comes to, like, these kawaii things or cute things, um... A lot of the times when it's animated characters, they have really round heads, really big foreheads, um, low and very, very round eyes, and they're super chubby. Um, if you need an example of this and you watch an anime, put in Chibi and then one of your favorite characters, and a quiet character is going to pop out. Um, ultimately, um, those characters also don't really have a mouth either. <laughs> They're usually drawn super, super small. Um, and Hello Kitty kind of defines this style, like Stefani kind of uh, said in the beginning of the episode. Uh, Hello Kitty is like the t like the most kawaii character and like the the foundation that it's built on. And it's what gets used in um, the Harajuku style that developed around Akihabara. Uh, Habra. Um, and essentially, this is two things. One, she's just really cute to look at. And the second one is it makes you go, oh, my God, it's so cute. I have to buy it. And if you're questioning this, think of all the small pudgy faces that you've seen on plushes and then you just buy. Um, and think of how many of them has mouths. And then I'm going to assume that a lot of you, because you like pop culture, have Funkos somewhere. Mm -hmm. None of your Funkos have mouths unless it's a specific design in which something is in their mouth. Yeah. Um, so Funko actually has the Hello Kitty style. Large, separate, round eyes, large, round head, no mouth. Little body. <laughs> <laughs> um, and all of this goes into the next but why, though, is that ultimately Hello Kitty facilitates this wave of understanding that cute and quiet isn't just for kids. It's something that can be for adults, too. Um, which is why I have so many damn stuffed animals. Ken Bolson, who is a co-author with Brian Bemmer of Hello Kitty's The Remarkable Story of Sanrio and The Billion Dollar Feline Phenomenon, uh, 
explains that kawaii resonates through generations and it's the reason for Hello Kitty's success. Ultimately, Hello Kitty came out in 1974 when Japan's kawaii culture was first emerging. And all of this ties into Japan's now well-known popular passion for cuteness in general and how it all kind of evolves out of this idol culture. And uh, Benson Belson also said she's the original and it's hard not to re- it's hard to replace her. She became the icon of cute for a whole generation and you can't buy that kind of lucky coincidence. And the fact that she's kept this kind of timeless look makes her um, essentially transgenerational in the same way that Pokemon is. Like multiple people have seen her, multiple people have fallen in love with her, multiple people buy her. This essentially, this idea that cute can't be for adults started to change in the 2000s um, when Hello Kitty started reaching new heights and people stopped worrying about hiding their love for cute things and they started embracing it. And this made a very, very large impact on Japanese culture specifically. And the U.S. is still fairly behind on that. We don't really have any animation that drives that. We don't have, I mean, I feel like it's normalized a lot at conventions with how many really cute things, but a lot of that just makes me wonder if, like, the Venn diagram of weeb and gamer just really overlap. So that's why they're there. But ultimately, this, like, obsession with cute and this exception of cute, especially for adults, comes when, um, Harajuku ends up bringing, uh, ends up coming to the U.S. and outside of just people's love for Hello Kitty and the marketing towards more a more adult audience, this idea of having an entire fashion style built around it made it something that was really really large. Um, and a lot of this has to do with celebrities, with celebrities loving Hello Kitty and really putting a spotlight on her, like um, Stefani mentioned Paris Hilton earlier. Yeah. Uh, there's Mariah Carey, Lady Gaga, um, RuPaul's Drag Race did an entire Hello Kitty challenge oh. um, where they had all of the drag queens make different Hello Kitty outfits and they made them make two. Like one was Hello Kitty couture and one was they just took like a Hello Kitty costume and made it their own thing. It's a really good episode. Um but at the end of the day, every time you see a celebrity wearing something from Sanrio and specifically Hello Kitty, it's not a sponsorship. They just like Hello Kitty. Uh, Sanrio doesn't partner or do advertisements with any celebrities. They're just people who love the brand. Wow. That's hot. Wow. That's insane. <laughs> I don't know why that's so crazy to me, right? Because it's like everywhere, but they don't part with anybody. Like they're so big time that they're like, you're going to pay you. You're going to promote my stuff because you just love it. Yeah. That's crazy. That's baller. That's super baller, actually. Um, also, Hello Kitty's the literal ambassador of Japan in China, um, which is really cool. In May 2008, Japan named Hello Kitty the ambassador of Japanese tourism in both China and Hong Kong, which are two places where the character is exceptionally popular among children and young women. And this marked the first time japan's tourism ministry had appointed a fictional fictional character to the role so i kind of want to get to y'all's perspective which you've kind of given throughout the episode of just being tourists in japan as well and just how hello kitty was around you i mean from my perspective like i don't like i don't look for hello kitty stuff but it's just everywhere right and like the kawaii culture is just so big that even the 2020 olympics characters like model some of that kind of like kawaii yeah. hello kitty style like that's just like how big hello kitty put kawaii on the map that they're literally ready to brand their 2020 olympics season to that kind of style and i think that's just insane to me and like their whole i mean what, what was it the 20 45th anniversary they put a whole floor on one of their biggest buildings in the entire country dedicated to Hello Kitty because it's that big in their culture. And it was literally a whole floor of this 650 meter tall building dedicated to Hello Kitty. And it's just insane. It was so great. You would go into the elevator and you're just like, Hello Kitty. And I was like screaming. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, their their elevator, like their instructional video is Hello Kitty. Like you walk around and you see commercials that are branded towards Hello Kitty. Like it was bigger than... We saw more Hello Kitty stuff there than we saw Pokemon. I just from 
you know, the, the small bit that we spent there for those two weeks. It's crazy. And, and I'm not surprised that they, like, let their ambassador be Hello Kitty and not, like, Pikachu because a Hello Kitty is just bigger in, I, in a lot of aspects. I was really surprised that they didn't use Hello Kitty for the Olympics. I was actually really surprised by that. That would have been insane. But they still <laughs> modeled, like, their characters off of it. So yeah. The Olympics still, still has to happen, though. I bet you Hello Kitty shows up in the opening ceremony. Yeah, what for sure. What if she does right? the lighting? Oh, that'd be insane. Oh, that'd be crazy. God. Oh, my God. It was everywhere. It was great. It was, ugh, it was so great. <laughs> Just Hello Kitty being <laughs> everywhere on drinks, on everything, toilet paper. <laughs> She's really excited about the toilet paper part. <laughs> I know. She keeps mentioning the toilet paper. <laughs> because why would you put Hello Kitty on toilet paper? Our toilet paper is basic. <laughs> yeah, I can't wipe my butt with Hello Kitty. And, 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 it's, and it's stupid because you don't really use toilet paper in Japan because you got the bidet. So why even do it? Also in the first true. Place? So why is Hello Kitty? On? That's that's just that's just a staying power. Maybe that's Kitty. why, because you don't use it. It just looks pretty sitting there. You're like, yeah, oh, I sense. really have to use you today. Two squares. Oh my god, god. that's so great. Anyway, um, outside of bathrooms. <laughs> you should buy yourself a bidet. <laughs> um, is there a Hello Kitty bidet? bidet? Like, you know there oh gosh, don't be. Google that. I'm surprised I didn't see it when we went to the store. Would they have all the true. bidets and stuff? I didn't see one. <laughs> Matt's vigorously shaking his head at the idea, idea of a Hello life. Kitty bidet. Good. <laughs> Everyone who comes back from, from Japan, they always say they miss the bidet. So it's important for everyone <laughs> to know. <laughs> um. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. If you want to know a little bit about Hello Kitty, uh, I mean, she is five apples tall. She weighs three apples <laughs> and her blood type is A. She bakes and wants to be a legendary pianist. So if you're five apples tall and you weigh three apples... Is that possible? I don't know, Matt. It's a cartoon. Okay. <laughs> it's possible. When she you also speak has no from mouth. The heart. <laughs> she has That's no mouth. Very possible. From the heart. <laughs> don't laugh. It's serious. And has a boyfriend somewhere. What was the boyfriend's name? No. Oh, I don't remember her boyfriend. I forgot about him. Boy- yeah, no, she boyfriend. doesn't have a boyfriend. She's an innocent girl. That's also, I guess, accurate, right? Yeah. Don't be putting that evil on her. Don't what be tainting like, her. She don't need no like, man. They're Washington apples, so they're like big apples. Are they Washington apples or are they British apples? I was like, yeah, yeah they be British apples. True. Huh? So they would be British apples. You're right. She's little. So she's really little. <laughs> um. So I did want to end the show with uh, the fact that as much as we love Hello Kitty... Um, Agretigo is really coming up there in notoriety, and a lot of it has to do with um, the Netflix show. Um, but it's more the content. Like, Hello Kitty is great because she's bubbly, and she's pink, and she's there, and she's cute, and she's kawaii. And Agretigo is amazing because she's really, really adorable, but also turns into a metalhead and deals with a whole bunch of workplace anxiety, depression, bad job and is pretty much sums up the people who grew up on hello kitty that are now adults <laughs> yeah yeah she definitely deserves her own episode pretty soon dude like, she she's... had her own little section in, J- yeah. in the store and, too she and had all, her... in all the stores she had yeah. a huge section just and, and all well, for her, her stuff San was Rio, kind of all over the place too in the sanrio uh store in la they do routine agretigo like they show up with erica mendez and a, the somebody in an agretigo costume and they have like an agretigo day at the sanrio store in la that's oh super cool i would have lost my mind if hello kitty or agretigo came out i lost my mind when i saw pikachu come out <laughs> i almost punched some kids to get out of the way but i didn't want to get like arrested so you can't do that. You have to go get have your baby in Taiwan. Yeah, it's true. Uh, Maybe in Taiwan we can do it. <laughs> hey, but for also, let's have a baby in Taiwan. Yeah. Um, that's all I had. So <laughs> if y'all have any like ending, like final thoughts, I'm gonna have a baby in Taiwan, and it's gonna happen now. 
I don't know whose baby it's going to be, but someone needs to pay for it. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, for me, Hello Kitty is huge. Right? Like, I've known, like, Stefani's loved Hello Kitty. I've known, like, Kate's been a big Hello Kitty fan since, like, I've known both of you. But, like, just from this episode, knowing that it's one of the biggest merchandising, pop, like, things, like, in the world, considering its target demographics, is huge to me. And that it's literally on everything, just the way the Pokemon is. Like... There, I found there, kosherworld.com has this link to this Hello Kitty bidet. Like, it, it's insane. <laughs> and I think that that alone just s- spells, like, why Hello Kitty matters. If you can put Hello Kitty on anything and it sells, like, that's that's crazy. And, like, and it's, insane. And it even sells to people that aren't, don't even watch anime or aren't even, like, weebs or gamers or anything like that. Like, I've met a lot of grown women that don't, aren't into that part. And they love Hello Kitty so much, too. It's something that you can relate with anybody. Hey, do you like Hello Kitty? No. Okay, well, we're not friends anymore. <laughs> well, <laughs> <on> that- <laughs> Matt, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I know Hello Kitty's big. I know people like it. I don't understand why people spend so money, much money just because we slap a sticker on things. But apparently that is something that happens, obviously, as they make a lot I of money. I would be buying a Hello Kitty Surface for PAX West. Why do people buy Apple products? I think I'm that has, I think I that has like a... I feel like that's the clo- closest thing to like slapping something on it. Well, I'm just I don't saying. think so because uh... Apple actually makes hardware. Well, I mean, yes, but I'm just saying like they change one thing. Mine and Adrian's <laughs> Mine and Adrian's unopened and, uh, uh, energy drinks from Star Wars are probably. Yeah. I was like, I was going to go Apple. with Disney or Star we, Wars over yeah. Apple, nah. but Disney How many... and Star Wars is it's justified and Hello Kitty. I can't justify Apple. I mean, if I gave you <laughs> Matt, if I was like Matt, there's this Oblivion bidet for like a hundred bucks, <laughs> or this regular bidet for a hundred bucks. Which one do you take? Yeah, but what if it was a regular bidet for like seventy bucks? No, those are your two no, options. No, Matt. <laughs> two <laughs> options Matt. Those are your two options, Matt. A regular Jeez. one or an Elder Scrolls one. Which one do you take? Well, obviously, if they're the same price, you get one with like, you know, like maybe some the design. sticker on it. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. But, but but when are they ever the same price? And sometimes they're less. No, we know that. We'll find you one. I'm being I'll serious. Sometimes, sometimes the Hello Kitty <laughs> stuff is less than what something else is. It is. I mean, it was. I have one brand. decoration that I've ever had in my entire life, and it was a, basically a Marlin that's got a broken fin that I stole from a like a beach house like twenty years ago, and that's it. There are Hello Kitty Swarovski earbuds that are not cheaper than other earbuds. <laughs> 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 I don't know, man. Like when I look at like the the Hello Kitty airplane, I just feel like even though I'd be on the inside and the airplane means nothing, I would be happier if I was in that R two D two airplane that I saw at the airport because it was sick looking. And I was like, I wish I could have ridden that airplane more than the basic airplane that I rode in to Japan. I think I would be more relaxed. If I had a baby inside one, <laughs> you just... I'd be more relaxed if I had an R two D two pillow instead of like a just a basic white pillow in my airplane. I agree. I agree. Why do you think I have my my giraffe pillow? It makes me happier. It makes me more relaxed. <laughs> does it go with the theme of our bedroom? No, it does not. Slap a sticker a hes- on it. it I have a hedgehog. I have a hedgehog and a tanuki sitting back here, and then I have a penguin and a cat. Stuffed animals sitting in our bed. I'm just going to buy Matt a bunch of Hello Kitty stuff and then just hope that it brings them happiness. And then it, and then it goes in the trash. <laughs> Watch, he ends up getting like, he becomes like super obsessed with Hello Kitty and like keeps it in secret. <gasps> Question, Kate. So if like people, like if like, so right, like the tar- target demographics are different, right? So Hello Kitty is, dem- is their demographic is obviously women, whatever age. And then like, uh, My Little Pony, obviously the same, but there are males who like My Little Pony, yeah. and they're called bronies. Is there a term for people, for males who like Hello Kitty? So I don't think that there's a term. I've never heard one, but I definitely know that there are guys who love Hello Kitty. Hmm. That's a good question. Bronies? There isn't a brony con or a Hello Kitty equivalent. 
con. Is there really a brony con? There is. Oh my Let's, let's God. go. I, I can smell it see. from here. That smells Ew. gross. Okay, anyway, let's finish. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stefani, for coming on. Uh, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you and your work? You can find me at Stefani Hearts on Twitter and Instagram, but mostly Twitter. Uh, S-T-E-F-A-N-I-H-E-A-R-T-S. Yes, I spelled that right. And then you can also find the podcast at El Cocoy. Oh, E-L. Oh, my God. This is hard to spell. E L. M I I no and <laughs> dude this is terrible I'll link in it defense, in the show notes yes, in, her, in her defense this is the first time she's ever plugged yes El Kukui is my neighbor and I'm the one who came up with like their twitter handle anyway so <laughs> <laughs> your fault anyways so yeah, go get fault. some uh... if you google El Kukui is my neighbor podcast you will find it uh, as always, thank you for listening, and you can find us at But Why the PC on all social medias. Uh, Twitter is where we're most active, and if you want to support us a little more and help support Matt by me, Hello Kitty things, head on over to patreon.com slash But Why the PC. You can find me at Oh My Myth Randier on Twitter. Adrian? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at SuperReach93, S-U-P-E-R-R-U-I-Z 93. Matt? You can find me apparently not at the Hello Kitty store as <laughs> I do not buy Hello Kitty things.